Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this regime to the Comp video, we're going to be discussing technology news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We'll start things off with AMD because the company have offered an official statement regarding the Radeon RX Vega 64 pricing. We have some benchmarks of the Asus ROG Strix Radeon RX Vega 64, which is very interesting compared to the standard reference design. And then finally, we will be taking a look at some results of the 7960X versus AMD's Threadripper 1950X. Both of those processors are overclocked. But we'll start things out, as I said, with AMD's official statement. So just so you're up to date with the news... Getting hold of the standalone RX Vega 64 air-cooled version, which is 499 US dollars, in Europe has been extremely difficult. Essentially, you've been needing to buy the packs. And many retailers, including Overclockers UK, have said that their cries for just standalone Vegas has basically fallen on deaf ears to AMD. And AMD have issued a statement with IOTech, Radeon RX Vega 64 demand continues to exceed expectations. AMD is working closely with its partners to address this demand. Our initial launch quantities include standalone RX Vega 64s at 499, Radeon RX Vega Black packs at 599 US dollars, and Radeon RX Vega 64 Aqua packs at 700 US dollars. We are working for our partners to restock all SKUs of Radeon RX Vega 64, including the standalone and gamer packs, over the next few weeks, and you can expect quantities of Vega to start arriving in the next couple of days. Now, these statements are a bit weird, because one of the strange ones, of course, is why are AMD shipping such a low volume of standalone cards? The other one is that you can't really say that the games in the Radeon Black Pack are free, because... Well, the GPU is $100 more, and let's be realistic, the games developers are being paid somewhere or another. It's not like, I don't know, the Wolfenstein developers or whatever are just like, yeah, actually, you can just have this game for free. We're not going to charge you at all. Of course, they're getting heavy discounts on the codes, but still, there are money obligations that AMD have to those developers, those publishers. What I find rather interesting is I was doing a little bit of digging around uh, once again, going to Overclockers UK, since they seem to be so vocal about this whole thing. And Gibbo, once again, on the forums, has a power color Radeon RX Vega 64, um, available at 578.99. That's great British pounds, this includes VAT. And he says that they have 1,000 units, they're limited to one per customer. And he says, and I quote, my advice is wait. I seriously doubt all 1,000 will be sold so quick when limited to one per customer. And our trade price is higher when our web pricing is put off slash prevent miners buying them all. Quite honestly, this launch feels just very rushed to me. And yes, AMD have made a statement and I appreciate that they've spoken out about this. Although, to be honest, they should have done so a couple of days ago. I feel that they should have pushed the standalone cards a lot more. I appreciate the packs. I really do. I'm not really bad-mouthing the packs. But I feel they should have been handled in a very different way to what they were. And my sentiments are probably not alone. I, I you know, Many of you have written to me saying this situation is just ridiculous. And if you actually look at a lot of comments on, well, pretty much any video or post talking about Vega, and this includes AMD's own official statements on their Facebook, a lot of people have just said, you know what, I just, I'm just i not paying this inflated price, I'm just going to go with a GTX 1080. And I'm not saying that they're wrong or they're right, but I can understand their frustration with this. So hopefully this whole situation gets resolved as quickly as possible. So this is also another rather interesting one. This pops up thanks to videocards.com, although it is via videocards.com because the news originates from a couple of other websites, including te uh, Computerbase and Hexus. Essentially, we have the custom variants of Vega starting to filter in, and those would be the Asus Strix Vega 64. We're still looking at two 8-pin power connectors, but the maximum power limit for this particular graphics card is 260 watts. So there's good news and there's bad news. The first is that it doesn't perform quite as well as a very heavily overclocked RX Vega 64 running at max. But what you do get 
is improved performance on default. How much more? Well, 2 to 7-ish percent, depending. But perhaps the big deal here is the sound. The audio levels are drastically reduced. You're looking at, for example, around 28.5 dB for the reference design, and these go all the way down to just 18.2. This is if it's an idle, um, and the sound, if you're running at uh, load, goes from 60, which quite frankly is pretty damn loud, down to just 45, which is a 24.8% difference. Power consumption, though, is an owie. You're looking at about 330 watts with load. If you are looking to buy Vega, it's still very early days. And once again, I'm not bad-mouthing the architecture. Quite frankly, I feel some of these issues, for example, the overclocking stuff, is going to be resolved with drive updates. And let's face it, we might also see additional performance. Personally, I do feel that the architecture will improve in performance at least 10% with drive updates. Maybe 15%. My gut feeling is that this launch was just rushed and I feel that they should have delayed it a little bit. I think they were just under pressure and they just needed to get it out at this point. I am curious, however, to see what issues will remain. Uh, and this includes some of the disabled features like uh, HBCC isn't working correctly. And, you know, um, I believe it's primitive discard accelerator also isn't working correctly. So I do want to know what, let's say, in a couple of months' time is going to be the state of affairs with those particular graphics cards. Are we going to have a situation where those uh, issues are ironed out? What performance benefits are we going to have? What differences are going to be remaining across like a myriad of different games? For example, is it going to be DirectX 12 titles benefit? Is it going to be, you know, HBCC works great across every game? It is very early to tell, and I feel that one of the problems that Vega is definitely having right now, quite honestly, is that the launch was very muddled. This is regarding the quantity, the pricing, the message as well for AMD to journalists as well as uh, just, you know, the public. And reviewers just weren't given enough time for the card. I think they should have at least had another week. That's my personal opinion. And it was pretty ov uh, obvious. If you can do some Googling about this, I'm not telling you any information that's like privy or anything like that. But even the drivers that were given to reviewers, overclocking just wasn't functional in the drivers. And it's it's just a bit weird, to be honest, this whole launch. I'm not saying the architecture is bad. I'm not saying it's good. I just am, at the moment, remaining very much on the fence. Anyway, uh, final piece of news today. and uh, This one is, well, not exactly pitting the cards. Sorry, pitting the processor together um, with an exact like-for-like -like comparison. But a website by the name of HWBot has basically broke two world records and set several new global first places with two different processors. One is the i9-7960X, which of course is Skylake X from uh, Intel. The other is Fredripper 1950X, which of course is from AMD and based upon the Ryzen architecture. They overclocked the processors to 5.6 GHz with Intel, 5.5 GHz with AMD. Now, that's one of the reasons I'm covering this, because, you know, most folks are not going to be running their processors at this clock speed. It's obviously not in the realms of, like, a basic AIO. This is, you know, kind of verging on the territory of you can't even have a prayer to do this unless you're running with, like, you know, liquid nitrogen or something. But because the two uh, processors are so closely tied in terms of raw clock speed... I do find the results rather fascinating. So, what is the situation? Well, the i9 beat Fredripper in 8 out of 9 tests. So, in short, Intel pretty much decimated uh, Fredripper, the 1950X. Of course, that sounds very impressive and it sounds really awesome for Intel. Hey, look, we just decimated like your top-end processor. After all, it essentially is still 16 cores, 32 threads, so one can easily say, if you're not taking anything else into account, excuse me, well, yeah, the i9-7960X is by far the better processor. And if you were to look at this, it's true. I mean, obviously, this is not exactly the widest set of benchmarks in the history of humanity. There's no gaming benchmarks, and there's no, you know, video editing benchmarks, and Yes, there is some transcoding stuff there, but it's not like you're getting like real-life workloads like, oh, I don't know, Adobe Premiere or After Effects and other such things. 
but it does give you at least insight in how these processes are performing. However, as we all know, that is very dishonest to say that, because really it's not down to the number of threads and the cores, it's also down to the pricing as well. It's essentially like me saying to you, well, these two cars have four wheels and an engine, um, let's race, oh look, this car beat this car. But, of course, what I'm doing actually is racing you with my Ferrari and I've left you in a, you know, ridiculously old car that you've got from the scrap heap. No, I'm not saying that that, in this case, is Ryzen, but I am saying that context matters. The context in this instance is, of course, Threadripper is considerably cheaper than Intel. So there is definitely that to take into account. And I do feel Intel do need to lower their prices for certain Skylake X processors because they're still way too expensive. Threadripper definitely has the pricing advantage. And when you're dealing with several hundred US dollars of a price difference, the fact that Threadripper is able to even somewhat keep up with Intel is incredibly astounding to me. So I still think that Threadripper is an amazing processor, but this um, set of benchmarks is at least interesting to see what these processors are capable of if you just let them run wild. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.